Hello and welcome. Well, Hong Kong's government has suspended its controversial plan to allow alleged criminals to be extradited to mainland China. The proposals resulted in mass protests in the former British colony, some of which turned violent. People are expected to return to the streets on Sunday despite the pause in the government's plans. Our correspondent Rupert Wingfield Hayes reports from Hong Kong. Fellow citizens and members of the media. As she stood alone at the podium, Carrie Lam must have known that every pair of eyes in Hong Kong was watching her. Would she or wouldn't she back down and drop the widely hated extradition bill? I now announce that the government has decided to suspend the legislative amendment exercise. Not a withdrawal then. So is this just a trick to pacify the protesters? It has nothing to do with an intention, a wish to pacify. I come to the view, I told myself, that I need to do something decisively to address two issues. How could I restore as far as possible the calm in society? And how could I avoid any more law enforcement officers and ordinary citizens being injured? The fear of more angry protesters returning to these barricades is what has prompted Carrie Lam and her administration to make what is clearly a major climb down. This is not a temporary pause to the extradition bill. This is an indefinite suspension. Nevertheless, it may not be enough to prevent very large crowds from coming out here again on Sunday for another huge show of discontent. On Wednesday, the police just... This young protester and many of his friends will be out there and possibly thousands more like them. They want the bill completely withdrawn but for them, it is about so much more. We don't trust the government. We don't need a small victory. We, we, we want to cancel the bill, but not temporarily. And I don't want to see Hong Kong to be invaded by the totalitarian government. The problem for passionate young Hong Kongers like this is that communist China is just 25 kilometers away across the harbor. And somehow they're going to have to learn to live with that fact. Rupert Wingfield Hayes, BBC News, in Hong Kong. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, the British-Iranian woman who was jailed in Iran on alleged spying charges, has begun a new hunger strike. She's been held since 2016 and denies any wrongdoing. It comes at a time of increasing tensions between Iran and Western powers. Our world affairs correspondent Caroline Hawley reports. These are the moments before Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe's arrest more than three years ago at Tehran airport. She thought she was heading home with her young daughter when she was approached by Iran's revolutionary guards, then accused of espionage and sentenced to five years in jail in a case that's been called a mockery of justice. Just a few days earlier, they'd been enjoying a holiday together with her family in Iran. Today in London, a celebration for Gabriella's fifth birthday, with her on the phone from Tehran. Happy birthday to you. Can you blow it out? But no cake for Richard Ratcliffe, as he joins his wife on an open-ended hunger strike. She called him from jail this morning. So previous phone calls, she'd been quite tense and, and sort of stressed and, and angry and, 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 you know, distraught. Actually today she was quite calm. You know, she'd made the decision. She said she sent her letter to the judiciary, so it's now started. Um, and, and yeah, she was kind of nervous as how she's handling the phone, but also calm, um, and we'll see how things go. This is a desperate move by an ordinary couple caught up in extraordinarily complex international politics. Their case is intricately connected to the difficult relationship between the UK and Iran, a relationship that's just got even more fraught. Last month, the US sent an aircraft carrier and warplanes to the Gulf within striking distance of Iran. The military build-up came a year after Donald Trump unilaterally withdrew from a key agreement with Iran to curb its nuclear ambitions. Tensions have escalated further with a series of recent attacks on oil tankers, including this on Thursday in the Gulf of Oman, one of the world's busiest waterways. The US quickly blamed Iran and Britain followed suit. Iran categorically denies involvement and has been angered by the British stance. Our message to Iran is whatever the disagreements you may have with the United Kingdom, there is an innocent woman at the heart of this. She just wants to get back together with her daughter Gabriella to reunite that family. Please show that you have humanity, show that you have a heart, let Nazanin come home. 
This morning, Jeremy Hunt met Richard Ratcliffe. He's praised the family's bravery. But there's concern that the latest trouble in the Middle East will do nothing to solve his wife's plight, as they embark on a joint hunger strike aimed at bringing their family back together. Caroline Hawley, BBC News. A series of attacks in Somalia and Kenya has left at least 25 people dead. Eight were killed by a car bomb in the Somali capital, Mogadishu. Sixteen others were injured. Gareth Barlow has more details. Smoke rises above Mogadishu moments after the car bomb exploded. Vehicles were shredded by the force of the blast. Buildings left in ruins. At least eight people confirmed dead. As I came out of the mosque, I saw a speeding car firing bullets. I took cover and soon the car drove off. The attack took place at a checkpoint near the Somali parliament. Across the country on Saturday, Al-Shabaab militants carried out a series of deadly attacks. I saw at least five dead bodies, including a religious man who came out of the mosque at the time of the blast. All those bodies have been removed. In neighbouring Kenya, eight police officers were killed by a roadside bomb in another attack that had all the hallmarks of Al-Shabaab. The militant group has seen its power dwindle in recent years, but despite that, it continues to wreak devastation and death across eastern Africa. Gareth Barlow, BBC News. Let's get some of the day's other news now. European election observers have called on Nigeria to consider urgent electoral reforms following what they describe as systemic failings in the recent elections. The EU mission said there were serious operational security and transparency problems. The poll, which was won by the incumbent Mohamedou Buhari, is being challenged in court by the main opposition candidate. India says it's imposing trade tariffs on 28 U.S. products, including almonds, apples and walnuts. The tariffs will come into effect from Sunday. India says the move is in response to Washington's refusal to exempt Delhi from higher steel and aluminium taxes. And the first female president of Slovakia, Zuzana Chaputova, has uh, taken office vowing to fight injustice. In her inaugural speech, the former lawyer and anti-corruption campaigner said that while people were considered equal under the Slovak constitution, too many found it wasn't the case in reality. You're watching BBC News. Fourteen people have been arrested after five separate attacks in London left three men dead and three others injured in the space of just 24 hours. Two teenagers were killed in separate incidents in Wandsworth and Plumstead on Friday, while a man in his 30s was fatally stabbed in Tower Hamlets on Saturday afternoon. The other two incidents were in Clapham and Brixton. The London Mayor Sadiq Khan said he was sickened by the incidents. Hundreds of homes in and around Wainfleet in Lincolnshire have been evacuated because of concerns that the river steeping will breach its banks again. The area has already suffered severe flooding after two months' worth of rain fell in just two days. From Wainfleet, Lakshmi Gopal sent this report. From the air, you can see the vast extent of the floodwaters. The river steeping, swollen after two months of rain, fell in two days. More flooding is expected and around 600 homes have been evacuated. This is the second time Rebecca and Jodie have had to move. You've got the where all the electrics have to dry out because you can't put them up back on. So it's finding the emergency accommodation that you're going to be setting basically a new home up when you know your, hum, your home's underwater. And it's so hard. It's horror. The Environment Agency says the river could breach at points where its flood defences are vulnerable. An RAF Chinook has returned today to help shore up the bank. It's this stretch of the river steeping that's expected to burst its banks. And that's why the RAF Chinook behind me there has been flying back and forth with bags of sand and gravel to try to plug any breach. Volunteers have travelled for miles to help the flood defence operations. We've been out for the past three days, we've just had to rescue a 97-year-old lady. Um, as I say, we're just dropping sandbags off, rescuing people, knocking on the door, making sure we can... Then you're dropping sandbags, uh, just basically helping people, doing what we can do. Emergency crews will continue to monitor the river levels, but for now, residents don't know when they or their families, four-legged or otherwise, will be able to return home. 
Lakshmi Gopal, BBC News, Waynefleet. Rivals competing to be the next leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister have dismissed suggestions they should withdraw and allow an uncontested coronation of the frontrunner Boris Johnson. They've been campaigning for the support of party members at a meeting in London. Our political correspondent Nick Erdley was there and his report contains flashing images. Blink and you'll miss him. Boris Johnson arrives at the first leadership hustings for Tory activists. In here, he told them he's a winner and he's undoubtedly the man to beat. But his rivals say a coronation would be a mistake. That would be a complete disgrace. The public deserve a chance to look at these leaders. Mr Johnson's opponents insist this isn't over. We had a coronation last time, didn't work out well, so let's not make the same mistakes again. Jeremy Hunt insists he can shock everyone and come from behind to win. Michael Gove agrees it's all still to play for. The leadership hustings so far have been taking place behind closed doors. That will change tomorrow with the first televised event in which five of the six candidates, minus Mr Johnson, will attend. But ultimately, those standing for the leadership know that it's people like the ones here, party activists, that they have to convince. But do you think the wider membership are, are listening, or is this a kind of, it's Boris and, that, and that's it? No, I think they are listening. I, I think they are listening. It's always, always, always was going to be Boris Johnson for me, but I'm, I now, um, I'm less sure who would be the second option. I had thought I was close to making up my mind, but I'm now, I've now got a bit more of an open mind after today. I mean, I'd vote Rob, I must say, if given the, given the chance, but... It's going to be Boris. Are members still listening Hello. to your pitch, Mr Hunt? They were, yes. The fight to be our next PM goes on. The longer this goes on, the more the underdog gets their shot. To beat this man, though, won't be easy. Nick Early, BBC News. The exam board Ed Excel has launched an investigation into how part of an A-level maths paper was leaked online. Blacked out images of two questions were shared on social media ahead of the exam yesterday. Pearson, which runs Ed Excel, said the images were circulated in a very limited way and that pupils would not have to reset the paper. Public Health England has sought to reassure people after two more patient deaths were linked to a listeria outbreak, saying the overall risk is low. A total of five people are now known to have died. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has ordered what he called a root and branch review of hospital food. Lee Milner reports. Two people have died at the Manchester Royal Infirmary, another at Aintree Hospital, after eating sandwiches and salads containing listeria. It's not yet been revealed where two other patients died. Listeria is a bacterium which typically causes mild food poisoning, but can prove fatal if people are already seriously ill. Tanya Marsden from Ashford in Kent was at the William Harvey Hospital having treatment for Crohn's disease when she became infected with listeria. Listeria can be fatal um, and that obviously is what's playing on my mind now. I worry about whether there's any lasting implications um, for me, particularly because my immune system is so suppressed at this moment in time. Eight trusts have been affected, but we've not been told which ones. I asked Dr Yvonne Doyle from Public Health England why. The full details of uh, the um, investigation and the trusts involved will be available next week. The reason we haven't put that out now is that uh, the clinicians have asked us to give them some time to have those discussions with the patients who are alive and with the relatives of those who have deceased. Well, the Health Secretary Matt Hancock has called for a review of NHS food. In a statement, he says he's deeply concerned about the issue and strongly believes that a new radical approach is needed into the way food is served in the NHS. The good food chain, which is being linked to the outbreak, has voluntarily ceased production. As investigations continue, Public Health England insist any risk to the public remains low. Lee Milner, BBC News. It's quarter past two in the morning. This is BBC News, our top story this hour. Campaigners in Hong Kong promise to keep going after mass protests forced the government to suspend a China extradition bill. Let's get more on that. Of course, protests are planned uh, later on Sunday. We can speak to Anthony Dapparan, the author of City of Protest, a recent history of dissent in Hong Kong. And uh, he's there now and joins us. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much for your time. 
Thank this you. has been a win for protesters and opponents of sorts, and yet people are still so angry. Why is that? I think people are incredibly angry at the way that uh, Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, has handled the entire incident, um, and particularly angered by the statements that she made at her press conference last night when she announced that she was uh, going to temporarily pause the bill. Um, a few things really angered them. Firstly, that it was just a, a temporary pause, she said, and not a complete withdrawal. They're also angered that she didn't apologise for the police behaviour at the protests on Wednesday, um, and also that they feel that um, she has uh, patronised really to the Hong Kong people, treating them as children um, and not sufficiently listening to, to their voices. What could the chief executive, Carrie Lam, have done differently uh, to kind of avoid the personal anger that she's experiencing? Well, I think the first thing she could have done is, is, is given the statement that she made last night, um, a week ago, uh, last Sunday evening, after a million people took to the streets here to protest. Um, immediately after that protest, the, she and her government came out and said they basically would be no change. And it took the violent incidents on Wednesday to really cause them to sit up and take notice. I think that's something that um, really, really angered people. And I think the, the second thing is just her messaging, which has been um, uh, consistently poor and, and the way that it's been presented to people has helped to really rile them up. Is there any clarity on how much this was Carrie Lam's pet project and how much she was under pressure from Beijing to get these laws through? Well, look, the official line has always been that this was entirely Carrie's idea. Um, she has said that you know, this was her initiative. Beijing have backed that up. But one really has to wonder, given the um, incredibly incompetent way that this has been handled and, and the attempt to sort of really ram it through, um, whether there wasn't some larger hand at force, because you'd expect that any uh, sensible politician wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't commit this kind of political suicide that she appears to have done. Now, you've looked back uh, at a history of protests and dissent in, in Hong Kong. You've written a book about it. These yes. protests, given that they've succeeded in some ways, has this changed Hong Kong for the future? Is it, is it a different kind of territory now? I think it's certainly um, uh, hardened Hong Kongers resolve. In, in the wake of the umbrella movement protests five years ago, largely seen as a failure, people were starting to wonder whether Hong Kongers had lost their, their spirit and perhaps no longer had much appetite for dissent, particularly as the Hong Kong government has aggressively pursued and prosecuted uh, the leaders of the, those protests five years ago. But I think the events of the past week have really shown that uh, Hong Kongers' spirit remains as determined as ever, and um, they will come out and, and protest and dissent against policies that um, they feel strongly about. All right. Anthony Daparana, an author, thank you so much for your time and your insights there. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Well, uh, Mass has been celebrated at Notre Dame Cathedral earlier. It's the first in the building since a devastating fire in April. Freya Cole has more. It's not your usual attire for a religious service, but given the iconic Notre Dame isn't structurally sound, a hard hat is a necessity. The intimate service is the first since a spectacular fire spread through the cathedral in April, devastating Parisians and sending shockwaves around the world. A monument such as the Notre Dame continues to live on even if there was a fire. It's not a lost monument, it continues to have life. Just 30 people were invited for a mass led by the Archbishop of Paris. It is with strong emotion that we find ourselves here celebrating the consecration of this cathedral. But we are profoundly happy to be able to celebrate the Eucharist. It is why it was built. Authorities now know the fire started near the base of the spire. Flames spread through the roof within a matter of hours, consuming more than 800 years of history. What was lost will never be exactly the same, but it can be rebuilt and replicated. Donations for the cathedral's reconstruction have hit nearly a billion dollars. It's the beginning of a new chapter in Notre Dame's ancient history. Freya Cole, BBC News. The next six. Let's get the latest weather now with Alina Jenkins.
Hello, another day where we've seen some torrential rain across parts of the UK, exacerbating the flooding we saw earlier in the week. This was Burton-upon-Trent in Staffordshire during Saturday afternoon. For others, blue skies and sunshine, and it's this mixture that we keep as we go into Sunday. Our area of low pressure still slow moving to the northwest of the UK and another frontal system working its way north and eastward. So this will generate showers through Sunday morning, initially across Northern Ireland, Wales, southwest England, but soon extending north and eastwards across much of the UK. Now, where these showers develop, they'll be heavy, they'll be thundery, they'll be slow moving. Some gusty winds as well associated with these showers. Here's an idea of average wind strengths, but the gusts will be even higher. Could well see some hailstones too. Meanwhile, across parts of southern and southeast England, fewer showers through the afternoon, more sunshine, so 20 or 21 Celsius, where we've got the frequent showers struggling to get much above 14 or 15. And these showers merging at times to give a longer spell of rain. Certainly the case as we go through Sunday evening, some heavy spells of rain working their way across northern England into Scotland, continuing across parts of Northern Ireland, some rain returning to Wales through the early hours of Monday morning. It's not a cold night for most. We're going to hold up to between 11 and 13 Celsius, high single figures across rural Scotland. So as we start the new week, our area of low pressure still to the northwest of the UK, generating some heavy showers for Scotland and Northern Ireland. A cold front draped across northern England and Wales, bringing some spells of rain through Monday morning, but turning more showery as the day wears on. To the south and east of this, mainly dry, some spells of sunshine, some heavy and thundery showers there across a large swathe of Scotland and Northern Ireland. So temperatures here again, 14 or 15 Celsius in the sunshine further south and east, 20, maybe 21 Celsius. Now, as we go into Tuesday, briefly, we see this ridge of high pressure across much of England and Wales and southern Scotland. Keeping an eye on this area of low pressure, though, bring some heavy rain later on Tuesday into southern parts of England. Still some heavy showers and longer spells of rain across parts of Scotland, but they should ease across Northern Ireland on Tuesday. Much of England and Wales having a mainly dry day with some sunshine, but keeping an eye on this rain arriving into southern counties of England later on Tuesday. Ahead of this, some warmth, 20 or 21 Celsius for much of England and Wales. We could see some heavy rain for a time later on Tuesday and into Wednesday. As that clears, things are looking drier and a bit warmer towards the end of the week. Bye-bye. This is BBC News, the headlines. Campaigners in Hong Kong are promising to continue demonstrating after a week of mass protests forced the government to suspend a China extradition bill. They argued it would plug a legal loophole and prevent the city becoming a safe haven for overseas criminals. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, the British Iranian woman being held in prison in Iran, has started a hunger strike to demand her unconditional release. In 2016, she was arrested and subsequently sentenced to five years in prison for allegedly trying to topple the Iranian government. She denies the charge. A Roman Catholic Mass has been held at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris for the first time since fire ripped through the iconic building two months ago. For safety reasons, the priests and other religious leaders attending the small service had to wear hard hats. It's 2.30 in the morning, now on BBC News, Dateline London. Hello and welcome to Dateline London. I'm Carrie Gracie. This week, Hong Kong in tears, Gulf tankers in flames and Britain's Marmite man in pole position to become the next Prime Minister. My guest today, Chinese writer Diane Weiliang, UK political commentator Steve Richards, Agnes Poirier of French News Weekly Marianne and American journalist Michael Goldfarb of the podcast FRDH. Welcome to you all. So Hong Kong wept last week. Its leader, Carrie Lam, well, she was in tears because so many of her citizens distrusted her assurances on a new extradition law and took to the streets instead in protest. The protesters wept because they'd been tear gassed by police, but their determination paid off. This weekend, the government suspended its plans for the extradition bill and said it would listen. So what next for the unique and fragile ecosystem that is Hong Kong. Diane, let's just uh, come to you first and ask, 
what happened here? Because this looks like a dramatic U-turn from a government which, even as late as Wednesday, was signalling defiance in, and, and sending out police with rubber bullets and threats. It is, in some ways, a surprising move if we look at the 2014 Yellow Umbrella movement and the standoff month and the Hong Kong government, in, in the end, one, if you could uh, prefer that term. And just most recently was the 30th anniversary of Tiananmen democracy movement, and we know how that ended. So in a well, way, that was Beijing rather than Hong Kong, which of course is supposed to have autonomy yes. under the one country, two systems. Uh, however, that autonomy, as we have been watching, has been eroded over time. So this is one country, two system. It's not absolute terms. So in a way, it was slightly surprising that Carrie Lam stepped down and postponed this vote. What is interesting is that overnight, she was reported to have cross-border to Shenzhen, met with the minister for Hong Kong from Beijing, and no one knew how, what they discussed. But my suspicion is this is the, you, the people's power, and the demonstrators are winning this round, but also a was sort of the result of international pressure. For example, Donald Trump had indicated that he could bring this up at G20 meeting with Xi Jinping in two, months, two weeks' time in the big context of China-U.S. trade war. And the U.S. Congress had also passed a bill and to assess annually Hong Kong's special trade status with the U.S. And so lots of different active group. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to the international dimension in a moment, but just to look at the action on the streets of Hong Kong, I suppose what was really noticeable on this occasion was the support that the protesters had, both from elements in the business community, the legal community. It wasn't just young students, was it? That was important um, for any scholars of Chinese history. And you China has had a long history of student-led movement that ended up in failure. And you, in 30 years ago, when the students went to Tiananmen Square, the big learning was we must do something that was different than the May 4th movement in 1919, which was to involve the whole of community, the workers, the civil servants, because student-only protests had never succeeded in China. I think this is a, one of the examples that showed in Hong Kong, with broader support and the voices of young people just became stronger. Steve, let's look at the UK dimension briefly, because um, obviously the UK has treaty obligations to Hong Kong until 2047, this 50-year period of autonomy, one country, two systems. But the UK was fairly slow, the British government fairly slow to get involved in talking about this extradition bill. I mean, really only since we've seen so many people on the streets. Do you think that was fear of Beijing or do you think that was misreading the mood in Hong Kong? Both of those, but also there's a, basically a vacuum in Britain at the moment. I mean, the, the ministers aren't behaving normally. So, for example, the Foreign Secretary is involved in a leadership contest. And I don't think uh, ministerial minds are focused very much on anything else. We're going on to Iran in a moment. And I think the same, to some extent, applies there. So it's partly that. It's partly the fact that it's trying to manage, in a way, uh, a, an arrangement that worked theoretically at the time, but will be constantly challenged in practice, because the power lies with China. And it's a constant, I think, will be a constant balancing act. So a combination where I think eyes are off the ball at the moment in the UK, plus a constant reading about where power really lies. It lies probably, even though this protest you say was successful, with the Chinese government. And, and Agnes, while we're, while we're doing the kind of people confused by leadership elections, there's obviously leadership kind of change going on in Europe. Um, do you think the underlying issues are the same as those that Steve's mentioned in relation to the UK, that kind of assessment of forces on each side? Yes, and also, I mean, you know, and, and the French citizen speaking here, it always pays off to take to the street. And the first round is victory for the people of Hong Kong. So that's a great uh, thing to, to see from Europe. Uh, but it's also... 
you know, from we're so far away and we know or we fear that Hong Kong is doomed eventually, that, um, you know, there's China, there's democratic China, that is actually Hong Kong. But in 28 years, you know, it's going to be complete, completely China. And already we know that some businessmen um, are moving their assets abroad and, and basically Singapore and Japan are, are going to welcome that uh, very international community with a lot of um, alert ties to, to uh, you know, Canada and Europe and, and America. And it looks as if, um, if you look back just five years ago, the, the umbrella movement, there was um, an optimism about it. But although we are very far away, we've seen, we're seeing this from far away, I can only see despair, really, and pessimism in Hong Kong, despite that great victory. So if we t we're taking a long view, it looks to me it's, it's the last battle of Hong Kong, really. Michael, what do you think the US makes of all of this? I mean, Agnes Menchus says this is democratic China, but of course, actually, there's only very limited democracy in Hong Kong. More democratic China is actually Taiwan, if you want to talk about meaningful. I mean, wh how does the US see all these political and financial and economic forces aligned? Well, you say the US. We, we have to really be specific and say, how does the Trump administration see things? And, you know, who knows? One of the problems with the chaotic international leadership of the Trump administration is that you just don't know. I mean, I'm sure that this would be will be used as a chip in any negotiations going on with China where there's trade war growing and we hear every week there's two or three different stories coming from one side or the other about, oh, we're going to raise tariffs here, we'll raise tariffs there, and this side's getting angry, that side's getting angry. I don't think democracy really enters into it. If the people in Hong Kong, if the brave, and, and can I just say how remarkable it is, you know, we, my Twitter feed is full of hashtag resistors who send out nasty things about Donald Trump and think they're f striking a blow for democracy. A million people from all walks of life went out into the streets. We saw the pictures. They were not met with flowers. And let's say that this is an action for democracy. I think that in, in the Trump administration, it becomes, oh, well, this is a chip to play. Mm -hmm. This is a, or a, another sporting metaphor. I mean, Hong Kong doesn't want to be the football being kicked between the People's Republic of China and the United States. And I do fear that, because I haven't read anything about this in, from American Congress people or anything, that this is an action of democracy. It's something else, mm. if they're paying attention at all. Um, I mean, I should probably just say on the, on the numbers, just to, just to qualify that a little bit, that that is obviously the numbers that the protesters said they had on the street and the police said they had for you. But we saw the pictures. We saw the um, pictures. Diane, I want, to take, I want to take us now to um, Beijing and its strategic objectives and how it sees its strategic direction in Hong Kong, because this must be a very difficult moment for a, a Chinese Communist Party which likes to see itself as unassailable, invincible, and likes to look like that on the street. Which they believe they are, and still. And what it is, is see, they see this as a setback, but also in the short term is strategic, because they have the Donald Trump meeting, the G20, they have the trade war, they have bigger fish to fry. And on the other hand, over time, I have to agree with Agnes that you will see Hong Kong deteriorating this sort of autonomy. And we already seen it happen. In this particular protest, people are already behaving very much like as if they were in China. They don't talk to journalists. They don't want to give their names. They wear masks so that they would not be photographed. Because they fear long-term victimization. Absolutely. And so it's very different from yellow umbrellas because the leaders of that movement all had been jailed. So Hong Kong is becoming more and more like China. And China knows. China has it's playing a long game. Yes. Absolutely. OK, we're going to have to leave that issue there because uh, we've got to talk about Iran now. As on May the 12th, so on June the 13th, except bigger attacks on two tankers in shipping's most sensitive choke point. Now, this time, with fires, that forced the crews of both ships to evacuate. The US said Iran was responsible. On Friday, it released grainy video to back up that charge. Iran hotly denies it. An aircraft carrier strike force is close by. Michael, how do you read this situation?
Well, I mean, I think this is just probably an escalation of two long-term anta antagonists um, who at the moment, uh, my guess is, because in Washington we know that the, we want a war with Iran faction is actually in the White House now, John Bolton, um, Mike Pompeo, who probably doesn't know much about it, but is following John Bolton, the Secretary of State and, and the National Security Advisor. Um, so they're pushing for aggressive action. And do you and, think and they the, really want a war, or is uh, no, it no, this is, I, I, I'm, no, I, I think that this is what we're... I don't think they really want a war. I think they'd love to have regime change if they could. Um, they can't. Um, and then, you know, in Iran, you have the... the Revolutionary Guards, and they have factions within. We don't get to know much about it because it's not possible to operate as journalists in Iran and really explain what's going on. So you might just have two hardline factions bumping up against each other. But the war question is really what's important here because a lot of people get upset. Well, we're going to have war. Um, I just remind people that, you know, Iran kidnapped 52 American diplomats and kept them hostage for a year. That's a casus belli. We didn't go to war. They blew up 250 plus Marines in Beirut. That's a casus belli. They didn't go to war. And on and on over the last 40 years. I think that where we are now is just a lot of tension and it may well increase incrementally. But, you know, the, the, we never think about the other player here, which is Russia. Iran and Russia are involved in Syria and intimately connected. Geographically, they are intimately connected. It's only a 500-mile drive from uh, Russia's main western Caspian seaport down to Iran. If you put all these factors together, you think, well, if Russia wants to intervene here, is there going to be a war? No, but there will be tension, and I think that's where we are. So that's the great game that you've set out, and obviously there's, on the other side, Saudi Arabia, um, the UAE, and, and, and various other regional rivals. Um, but, but on the direct question of who actually attacked these tankers... Well, you know, I, I really worry about the rush. I mean, you would think all signs point to Iran. I mean, even the Foreign Office today said, uh, or yesterday, Jeremy Hunt said... On a balance, we, we think it's Iran. Um, but Steve just eloquently and briefly pointed out that nobody's really paying much attention at, at that level in the British government, so they may just be echoing America. You have to say, who benefits from doing this? And you think, well, they didn't sink anything. They made a point. The Japanese owner of one of the tankers said, actually, it wasn't landmines. It was something that flew in and hit the side of the vessel. And it happened on a day when the Japanese prime minister was in Tehran. Tehran. Exactly. So you think everybody's making points. And, and you know, you have the G... We, we've spoken about the G20 meeting. You know, at the end of this month, there's meant to be a big meeting in Bahrain where we're going to discuss... Where we not me, um, where, where the U.S. is going to present its plan for Israel-Palestine peace. I just think, you know, it, it's about getting attention. And Lord knows we're talking about it, so they've got attention. And, and Agnes, what about the European perspective on this? Are the Europeans this weekend blaming Iran or are they blaming the Trump administration for tearing up the nuclear deal? Well, they haven't been as quick as the UK to actually say, oh, yes, we completely uh, concur with uh, Donald Trump's uh, um, evidence. Um, actually, Germany said, well, uh, we need more evidence. Um, and I don't think uh, President Macron has said anything yet. Um, but actually, it might be Iran, or it might not be Iran. Mm. Um, but all this is the result, I think, of the very undiplomatic um, move by uh, Trump to withdraw from the 2015 nuclear deal we had and with, with Iran, which took, which took so many years to actually strike. But how does that relate? Well, because the, I mean, the diplomacy of Trump um, as regard to Iran is all co co coercion, basically. So we're going to cripple your economy, more sanctions, um, and uh, what, what is there for Iran? You know, Iran made a real effort um, in, with, the, with the agreement. It was not a perfect agreement, but it was something. Um, and actually, Iran, a few weeks ago, do you remember, said, well, you know, if you are... Uh, really wanting to ruin our economy, we're going to uh, take measures. So perhaps it's those yeah, little so attacks. That question open. And talking about those who leave the question open, um, the opposition in the UK, Jeremy Corbyn, has said we shouldn't be rushing to judgment on this. Um, so where does that leave him? It leaves him making a distinct 
point, and uh, in my, he'll get criticised for it, but in my view it's quite healthy uh, to have a British political leader not automatically rushing to assume that the US judgment on this is right. Quite unusual in British politics. Normally a Labour leader of the opposition will feel so under pressure to show their, in inverted commas, responsibility to lead as a potential Prime Minister. They would follow the orthodoxy. Corbyn never follows the orthodoxy. Now he gets condemned as being anti-American instinctively and so on. But I think at this point, where the evidence is not definitive, it is very healthy to have a sceptical voice as prominent as the leader of the opposition. And quite unusual, not for him, but in British politics over the last 30 years, where there's an immediate consensus, which often proves to be wrong. And, Diana, I don't want to leave China out of this discussion either, because, of course, you know, global economic superpower, huge growing interests in that region, and both those tankers last week were bound for Asia. So where does China sit on these issues? Well... China is one of the largest importers of oil from Iran. It's a huge customer. And China has always said, in some ways, together with Europe, that when Trump withdrew from the deal, that this was going to happen, that the tension will rise in the region. And China has always been against that move. And China, together with South Korea, Japan, had exemption from importing oil up to very recently, November of last year, when Trump cancelled that. And so, in a way, that was the last lifeline for Iran's economy. Now it's being strangled. So, what, it, it, it's not uh, out of question that Iran would have to react, and this has been predicted by many countries, China included. OK, and we'll leave that uh, topic there, because we're going to come Back to the UK now. We are less than one week into the Conservative Party contest to find a new leader and a Prime Minister to, to lead the country out of its Brexit crisis. But several candidates have already fallen by the wayside. Is the front runner now heading for a coronation? I think that's when you, one for you, Steve. The front runner being Boris Johnson, the former Foreign Secretary and stand-up comedian and various other things that he's done at various points. Uh, well, he's clearly the front-runner. I don't think it will be a coronation. I think the contest has to continue uh, into what becomes the last two candidates, like a who done it, going to the party membership. I don't think uh, the party membership want or would allow a coronation before they get the chance for that. Um, but what and I yet, find... of course, that is the speculation this weekend, that in He's Westminster so far there ahead. are forces well, it, it, who are saying, let's wrap this up, there's too much blue and blue conflict. It, it, it might happen. They might say, look, let, let just Brexit is so important, let's not extend this unnecessarily. I suspect there will be a contest which goes to the party membership. What I find so interesting about this contest is that uh, more than most leadership contests, all kinds of extraordinarily wild pledges are being made, as if this new prime minister would be elected into a parliament in which he or she could do what they wanted. But what's unusual about this contest is it's taking place in a hung parliament. So the new Prime Minister will have no control over that Parliament. Leading in a hung Parliament demands almost impossible skills of patience, of cunning, of charm, of mastery of detail, of accepting defeats and carrying on. Every Prime Minister who's experienced it goes through forms of political hell. And it seems to me neither the membership nor the candidates are addressing that context. They're all saying, oh, we'll be out of the EU by the end of October, or, you know, tax cuts here, tax cuts there. It won't get through a hung parliament. Mm. And the skills of a potential leader in that situation have not been tested or even raised as an issue so far in what's been a kind of fantastical contest in the sense that plenty of fantasies are out there. Michael, what's your take? Well, it, it's interesting. Steve talks about this, and, and I think we all, you know, the joke about the unicorns in, in the Brexit deal have now extended to the entirety of, of the leadership contest. And what, what I watch cause, is that we never talk about Jeremy Corbyn when we start talking about Brexit and the, and the Conservative Party, but one of the dynamics that I've noticed is for this system to work, and actually it's true in, in the United States as well, is there has to be a viable opposition. It's, it acts as a buttress to keep the abstracts of our political processes 
you know, going like a bicycle, you know, has to turn over, otherwise it falls over. And because of the nature of the Labour Party leadership, that buttressing simply doesn't exist. And so it's, you know, if there was a plausible opposition, you wouldn't have a dozen anybody's contesting this leadership. There'd be one or two plausible candidates because you have a, you know, Labour would be presenting a plausible opposition platform. But because Labour is absent on Brexit, which is the big question confronting the country, is trying to have it both ways, because Jeremy Corbyn hasn't really built on the surprise result of 2017, it allows the Conservative Party to go off into cloud cuckoo land, which is what it seems like, and you end up with Boris Johnson. And, you know, on this program a year ago, when we had, you know, Conservative voices on, uh, you know, I've been told Boris Johnson will never be prime minister because the parliamentary party, the conservative parliamentary party, hates him. And here we are a year later, and he's going to be crowned. Agnes. Well, where do we start? Um, look, there, are, there is only one candidate that is facing uh, reality. His uh, name is Rory Stewart. Of course, he doesn't stand a chance of, of being elected as the head. And what do you think is the reality that he's facing in a way that others aren't? Because basically all the others say we're going to renegotiate the withdrawal agreement. This is not going to happen. They, all they can do is to rediscuss the political declaration with Brussels, with the EU. Um, and, um, and Rory Stewart is the only one to say actually there is only one withdrawal agreement. He, he, he also is not confrontational. You could see how other is a pure... Tory, you could see how perhaps being very different from Theresa May, it could build a consensus in, in, in Parliament. But anyway, let's not talk about him because he's not going to be elected. Um, and, Boris and, John and obviously Boris Johnson says, just on your point about what's not negotiable, he doesn't believe that because he believes that the closer you get to a possible no deal, then Brussels... Um, Brussels will change its mind. Do you think, I mean, Brussels is obviously very familiar with Boris Johnson from various different episodes in his career as, as journalist, as Brexiteer and as Foreign Secretary. Do you think they think bring it on when they see Boris Johnson uh, so far in the lead or do you think they're brooding and, and, and muttering? I think both. Um, you know, they are bewildered like the rest of us in Europe. Um, and um, this national exercise in self-harming is, is bewildering to watch. Uh, you don't like seeing a friend doing, you know, being uh, um, self-harming, basically. And uh, um, Boris Johnson, the problem is, you know, it's a deadly combination between narcissism and laziness. And you don't get, you don't, you don't achieve anything in politics, especially negotiating uh, with 27 other members with that quality. Or, 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 or I want to put, I want to get Diane in here. I mean, Agnes, um, you know, obviously not a big fan of Boris Johnson, but his supporters say he will bring energy, he will bring charisma. Well, I think the dysfunction of the Tory leadership election. It's a reflection of the dysfunction of politics in the country, where only one item has been catching attention for the past three years and exhausted everyone's energy. So it becomes who can promise the biggest and the best solution on this one single solution alone. And whether it will be achieved or not, it's completely cast to the side. And I think that is the reality that you know, these contexts are representing. And so we're not looking at the quality that required for a PM. Which, in and a way, just, just coming back to you, Stephen, we're, we're running short of time at the end now. But, but, I mean, these kind of messages suggest that perhaps another few weeks of this contest is not really what the nation or, or what some will want. Well, I think they will, because Theresa May, if you remember, got uh, crowned with the thorny crown of prime ministership after a very short contest when she wasn't really tested. And so I think they will continue with the contest. The reason why, I, mean, I did worse than your fellow panellists saying a year ago he wouldn't get it. I wrote a column, so it's probably out there somewhere. Well, that's very honest uh, of saying you. Saying that I, I thought all the rules of politics suggested he wouldn't 
get it. But Why? I think what's changed um, that just briefly in 10 seconds, there was a sort of hysteria around him and the, where there's hysteria, candidates don't tend to win. But what's changed in 10 seconds is uh, Donald Trump has given permission for candidates to surface with epic flaws and win. And uh, Nigel Farage is this great campaigner and they feel specifically on Brexit and they feel they need uh, a, a winner in inverted commas in that context and they think it's him. So I think those two factors have made him now the clear favourite when a year ago many were saying he wouldn't get to the last two because MPs wouldn't back and him. And there we have to leave it. Thank you all so much. And that is it for Dateline London for this week. We're back next week, same place, same time. Goodbye.